I'd like to go to our last speaker, uh, Janet de Gazon. Uh, Janet is the gender-based violence uh, lead at Camino Wellbeing and Mental Health. She coordinates and facilitates the Strong Moms Safe Kids group, supporting mothers who have experienced intimate partner violence and their children. She is the co-chair of the Waterloo Region Domestic Violence Service Coordination Committee and is a registered psychotherapist and child and youth worker. So Jan, thank you very much for being here and I'll turn it over to you. So yes, I'm here to represent Camino. Um, and for those of you who aren't maybe familiar with um, Camino Wellbeing and Mental Health, um, we bring together the unified efforts of KW Counseling, um, Corizon and Monica's Place. Um, and so in April, we unified um, and became Camino um, as one organization, which allows us to really support folks in so many different ways from birth to seniors, um, to out community outreach. Um, and we have specific supports for those who've experienced gender-based violence. I will talk about those specific supports in a moment, um, but I really wanted to spend some time tonight speaking from um, a place of building empathy and compassion and helping really highlight and, and shine light on the barriers to leaving an abusive relationship. Um, because I think when we can recognize the barriers, um, then we can work towards trying to break those barriers down. Um, so I, um, I'm sharing with you here some input that was um, provided from folks who access support at Camino, survivors of abuse, um, when we were asking them a specific question. Um, so often when people are in an abusive relationship, they're asked, um, why didn't you just leave? Or why didn't you leave sooner? Um, and while that like that may come from a well-intentioned place, um, the person asking those questions may be concerned or they're care, they care for somebody, um, that question can really come with a lot of um, judgment and it can really be quite shaming. And it also places a lot of responsibility on the person who've experienced the abuse as opposed to the person who's behaving abusively. So we, when we reframe that question and kind of shift it to be um, more compassionate and ask what are the barriers to leaving? Um, I know Sarah spoke on this a bit as well, or um, what would help you to be safer? then we're speaking from a place of compassion. And I think this is really important to understand because there's so many reasons why um, I'm, and I will, you may hear me say women often, um, that's who I tend to work with. So I, and that is who is most often impacted by intimate partner violence. But there's many reasons why it's um, difficult to leave an abusive relationship. And there's also many reasons why sometimes it's not safe to leave at that time. Um, and it is safer to stay. So these are some of the contributions that I'm sharing with consent from um, people who've accessed our support. And I've categorized these into some specific themes um, to break that down for you. So what comes up often is fear. And um, fear and children are on the same slide here intentionally because there's a lot of fear for the mothers in particular about what may happen to their children, whether they may, may lose access or custody, um, but also, their child's safety if they're continuing to have unsupervised visits with the person um, who abused them. Um, we know that abuse is rooted in fear, um, creating an, an environment where there is a lot of fear. And if we know this person has a history of, of behaving aggressively and then they're left alone um, with children, there's very valid reasons to be scared about their safety. And I'm not saying that always is the circumstance, but that, that can happen. Um, as well, fear of being killed or harmed. Um, we've talked a little bit tonight about some of those risk factors and it's a very valid fear. Um, leaving is one of the most uh, risky times. And so many people are very afraid for their life. Um, this also comes with fear of change and the unknown. Um, change is hard, starting fresh. Um, Partners may have made that of suicide that sometimes comes up. Folks, this kind of comes with this course of control that was touched on a little bit earlier, but um, it's, it's not uncommon for an abusive partner to threaten that they may commit suicide if they leave, if, they, if their partner leaves them. And so what, a, what an incredible responsibility to place on somebody. Um, as well, children, a lot of um, mothers have reported that they they are, they care and they're concerned about the impact that this will have on their children, um, losing a loss of a relationship with another parent, 
they have that wish and hope that they could keep their family intact. And then we think about the barriers that they may face in providing for their children after leaving. As a single parent, um, especially in our economy, being able to provide food and shelter um, and meet basic needs, which kind of ties in with our next theme, which is lack of support. Um, and this support can come um, emotionally and, and, and physically as well. Um, so many folks report feeling um, a lot of judgment. And that question I kind of posed at the beginning really is an example of where that can begin. Why do you stay? Why don't you just leave? Um, for those who are in, in members of faith groups, sometimes there's um, religious beliefs around divorce and separation. So fear of judgment or shame from their, their community, uh, as well as friends or family. And money, um, I think that is a pretty clear barrier, but um, economic abuse is very common um, in an abusive relationship, which would involve um, controlling one's finances or their ability to have employment. Um, and if you're trying to leave an abusive relationship, you need money, um, you need housing, you need to be able to provide for yourself, you need to be able to provide for your children. And in many cases, you need to um, access legal support. So you need to have the means to be able to do that. Another barrier is, um, you know, I kind of encompass this all as mental health and well being because I think there's an, a, many of these points really fit in this broader category. But um, the biggest theme that um, women would share is just overall exhaustion and overwhelm. Um, so if we're thinking from the survivor's experience and what they're enduring for a long, often long time, they are um, having their self-esteem and their self-worth diminished and they're enduring um, the abuse, which on its own is exhausting. And then they are attempting to thrive and survive and carry on. So there's the, the emotional exhaustion of that. Um, if they leave, there's the exhaustion of navigating the legal system, which David spoke about how challenging that can be and how overwhelming that can feel. Um, as well, um, Lynn, you spoke on if there has been brain injury, um, this added level of, of cognitive impairment and challenges that can be that people can face when they're trying to heal and they're trying to take care of themselves and they're trying to take care of someone else. Um, I also wanted to touch a little bit on, on one of these points here, which is the partner's mental health and their addiction. So if we think to the beginning of the relationship, um, you know, the relationship typically was entered because there was love um, to start and um, there was a connection and abuse typically starts to evolve and show up over time. It doesn't um, always necessarily start right from the beginning. And so in some cases, um, there's mental health concerns from the person who's behaving abusively, in many cases, I would say, um, and, and often um, struggles with addiction. So there is that compassion from the person who was abused, from the survivor, for their partner, um, because there's there's that uh, depth of love and, and empathy that they have for the other person as well. So knowing that if they leave, um, the impact that may have on them um, as well, if they're struggling with their own mental health and their addiction, and especially if children are involved, you know, this is someone who's the parent um, to their child. So they do care. So I just wanted to put this um, quote up here because I really find it impactful. And, and just to leave you with something for tonight, I do have, I'm going to speak on Camino supports in a moment, but um, if you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three ingredients to grow exponentially. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. If you put the same amount of shame in the Petri dish and douse it with empathy, it can't survive. So if you're, I just encourage you, if you're, if you are supporting or you, you know, someone who um, is in an abusive relationship or you suspect they may be to really, to approach that with empathy and, and care and concern um, and, and try to understand all of these barriers and all these reasons why, why people do stay. So uh, what can we do? <laughs> what can you do to help? What can we do at Camino? Um, I did want to point out this website here. I really find it very helpful for you if you have if you're concerned about a, a another person that you care about. Um, this is uh, Neighbors, Friends, and Family, which is um, produced by the University of Water or sorry Western, and 
this is an online training. It's free. So it's, it's has some great videos, some great information, how you can support someone that you're concerned about. Um, and it's completely accessible on their website. And I believe Reagan has this, these links and we'll share these as well. And then at Camino, um, so we offer supports, um, very broad supports, but we do have some very specific gender-based violence supports, which I'm going to um, touch on here. Um, all of these can be found on our, our website. I linked the specific landing page for the gender-based violence supports here. Um, and folks can access um, support through us by contacting our, our intake team through our, so our wayfinding team and they help with service navigation. So they can complete an intake, but they can really um, help connect people with the right support and the right service. So we really think of um, our supports in, in the experience of abuse on a continuum. So we, we think first of prevention, early intervention. And so we have relationship supports and then we um, move on towards people who are in abusive relationship, who've left an abusive relationship um, and are healing or recognize that they're maybe in an unhealthy relationship. So when it comes to relationship supports in particular, um, this is kind of that preventative lens. This is that early intervention lens that Amy really talked about as well. Um, with our hope that we can maybe intervene before it becomes abusive. And we can do this through individuals, um, individual couples and family counseling. Um, we also have something called single session quick access counseling. So that's like walk-in counseling where people can come in on our hours are Tuesdays and Thursdays, 12 to six, um, folks can walk in and they can speak with a counselor. Um, I will say now that finances uh, are never a barrier to accessing our supports. So our intake will work with people and we have many subsidies available um, of ways of helping folks who've experienced abuse access support. So we have many groups and workshops. I'll just touch briefly, the survive, supports for survivors are quite similar. I do want to point out um, that we do have some very specific intimate partner violence groups um, for survivors and that we also have 2S LGBTQIA supports from our okay to be me team, as well as newcomer supports where we have interpretation available. Um, Amy spoke on the family violence project, so I will leave that there, but we are a member of the family violence project. And then this is just the last website I would love to share with all of you for if you're looking for um, who does this work, who else we try to work very closely with community partners. And um, the Domestic Violence Service Coordination Committee is, is a committee of 20 members across the Waterloo region that do this work. So this website is very helpful. All these partners are listed there and the work that they do, as well as many resources for people who, um, who've maybe experienced abuse. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, it's interesting, uh, the whole concept of stigma, because we, we see that a lot of times in drug strategy issues and, and other things and stigma here too. You know, it's almost like that sense of failure in a relationship or what have you. But, um, uh, and thanks for pointing out that, but I just want to ask, there was a, a question in here yeah. uh, from y Yumiko, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, uh, which I thought was interesting and, and I wanted to direct to you. And it's a question, and then what is being done in your field to maximize cultural competency and accessibility of support for members uh, uh, of the BIPOC community in Waterloo region. So the you know, cultural issues, that sort of thing. Can you, t are you, are you able to touch on that through your work with Camino? Absolutely. Yeah, Yumiko, um, it's a really very important point because we know that people's experiences, depending on their culture, um, are very different. Um, so we do, we certainly do have a diverse range of counselors available um, and we try to accommodate when, when people go through an intake, we do screen and ask if they're, if they're open or they're interested in sharing anything about their gender or their faith or their, their culture. So that if that's important for them, that we can try to pair them with a, a, like a counselor that would meet them, that need. And then our newcomer wellbeing and mental health program um, in particular can support um, people of all races um, and I, minorities but also um, those who are refugees and newcomers to Canada. Um, and we try to offer interpretation um, services. And we try to work with our grassroots organizations as well. So if we couldn't meet those needs and there was a need, then we would certainly um, refer out and do our best to help connect people with the appropriate support. All right, Jan, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And it's obviously, as our community grows and the diversity of our community uh, those are important issues and important to, for people to know that there is services available for them. 